And I'd like to first of all thank most sincerely the sponsors, to Klaus and to Sudi for inviting me to this uh, prestigious meeting. Um, quite an adjust audience you have before me and uh, I, I must thank you very much for the invite. Um, I also must declare that I work for Cube Vision as a paid consultant um, four days a week. Um, they actually paid my airfare and they actually paid for my time as a paid consultant with them, so I must declare my interest there. But this particular presentation is completely generic. But Sudi was a little bit uncertain because, uh, as I say, I'm a paid consultant for Cube Vision, and which Cube Vision would be here? Would it be me as a Cube Vision representative or a private practitioner? And at one point, he even suggested took a lie detector test. But after experience of this is a simple lie detector. I'll ask you a few yes or no questions, and you just answer truthfully. Do you understand? Yes. I decide against it. So the remit today is going to talk about the evolution of multifocal lenses. So we've come around for, for some years now, from many years ago in the 1950s with John DeCarr to present day multifocals. And the multifocal business is worth about $500 million worldwide. So it's not a small business, it really is a big business for the companies to, to chase. But every stream has started at the beginning. And really the thing we have to talk about first of all is monovision. You're all very familiar with monovision, it doesn't mean me to tell you what monovision is. Um, but all the same, it does have serious restrictions. Ideally, if you have a third eye, but most of you don't have a third eye, but we do know the restrictions of monovision are really on stereocuity. And there's some interesting work that came out a couple of years ago um, by Dave Elliott and his group that he showed that a slow walking velocity with monovision correction suggests that it has become more cautious when walking. So that is hard evidence that it does affect things. And there's even, you may know, of a plane that, that tried to land on LaGuardia Airport and that overran the airport, overran the, uh, the runway. And the board actually decided that pilot's monovision was the reason for the overrun over an aircraft at LaGuardia Airport in New York. So there are restrictions to monovision. It doesn't work in high powers, only in low power. So we really have to move away from monovision if you want to be successful in correcting the presbyopia of our patients. And indeed, it's now become quite evident that uh, monovision is declining, except in the southern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere for some god unknown reason in New Zealand and Australia, and Brian Holden are doing, those two particular countries, monovision is still quite prevalent. Other than that, most countries now don't fit, multi that fit monovision, they have to be predominantly multifocals, and for a good reason. I've changed a huge amount in the last few years. But to talk about multifocal contour lenses, you have to talk about two aspects of it. The first aspect is about RGPs, rigid gas member lenses, and then we'll move on to soft lenses where the bulk of the market is. But RGPs, while I work in my practice, are very successful. And they hit the nail right on the head, particularly the translating lens. This is a video of the Pro Corny lens presbyte. And you can see the little laser marking there, so it doesn't rotate, it's prison ballasted, you will know how prison ballast works. It's fairly quite loose, you can see it's quite freely moving on the eye. And so the patient looks down, and of course the lens rides up into the reading area. They're like specs, they have two distinct areas. Vision results with these are very good indeed, very good, because they have two separate areas as opposed to some simultaneous vision. The important point to, to remember. But they're expensive, they're difficult to fit. You have to make sure you fit them correctly, but when you do get them right, they're very successful and very high prescriptions. When you draw back against the pressure light, it's not so good against target patients. Then we have the aspheric, and the aspheric is the majority of gas thermal than are. This is the Quasar Plus, which is a back surface aspheric, very popular and very successful. And also it can become in target form. But you can actually order back surface target, so you can actually correct the astigmatism as well as at the same time correcting the, um, uh, the presbyopia. So this lens works very well indeed, it's very popular. The only drawback to it is you can see from its fluorescent pattern, it has a fluorescent um, slight lift and quite positive lens in the centre lens, and actually distorts the cornea slightly. So when patients wear the lens all day, come home in the evenings, take the lens out, put the specs on, it's like orthokeratology, you find the lens, the vision is not very good when you take the lens out. It takes about a year, perhaps a year, it takes about an hour for the, for the vision to restore. But those are the two main forms. There are other designs, the ASFREC designs, they're very easy to produce these days, ASFREC multifocals, 
and uh, as I said, results are very exciting and they're very good indeed. But the fact of life is, they're not used. This is Phil Morgan, um, who looks at the new fits worldwide, and these are new fits of uh, RGPs, but it's, it's very few indeed, um, new fits and refits, it's quite low. So gas thermals occupy about 10% of the continent's market, and about 10%, perhaps 1, 2% of North Focals. It's a shame because, as I say, from a vision point of view, they do offer a very good solution indeed. Very good solution. And as I say, you can correct astigmatism as well. And as you say, 40 to 45 percent of our patients have some form of astigmatism. It's useful to use an RGP. But reality is, it's soft lenses, and that's where the market has gone. But we have one immediate disadvantage with the soft lenses. It sounds elementary. It's a fact. They don't move. Um, a soft lens that moves 0.2 millimeter, 0.1 millimeter. That's it, all you're going to get out of it. So there's no translating effect, no alternating effect. The whole thing has to be simultaneous vision. All the optics are going to lie over the centre of the pupil, which immediately creates a bit of a disadvantage. The majority, this is a, a centre dis, uh, centre distance. Uh, obviously, the plus power we've effectively put on the periphery. So by altering the front surface asphericity, by altering the eccentricity create more plus power in the periphery and have better vision in the distance. Um, that is in one or two lenses, but the majority by far and away of the soft hydrophilic multifocal in the market at the present time are centenaire. Many are centenaire. And that creates a slight problem, it means it can be fit much more accurately. And there's other things you have to take into account which I should mention in a few moments. The other, thing, the other combination you can use which works well is some patients and one company creates a, a centre distance from one eye and a centenaire for the other. So we're in a pair of centre distance, or a pair of centenaire, and you know, one for each eye. That does work well. But the big problem is, of course, is that they're very much pupil dependent and you have to be very careful when you make the reading ads too strong. Um, when you have high ads of plus two, plus two fifty, is that they actually obliterate the pupil and so you can find the distance vision can be quite poor in them. There's a number of things you have to look at when you fit these. It's not just off the shelf, have a blister on the eye, like you do with a single vision lens. But there's a lot of considerations to be made. And before we get into the actual presentation, just to complete things, I've mentioned RGPs, I've mentioned soft lenses, I synergize, you probably many aware of from the fitting of the clear cone through keratoconics. I actually make a lens called Duet, which is um, it's quite ingenious. You have a silicon hydrophilic silicon skirt and RGB in the centre. So it's not like previously where they had a low DK materials, you use high DK materials and the lens is much more comfortable than RGB because it doesn't move. The first lens I showed you with the pressure light on that moved quite a bit, quite chunky, the patients sometimes feel it. This because it doesn't move of course is far more popular. So that's a quick run through of what's available to us, what we can actually do. And uh, that's what the, broadly speaking, what's available on the continent's market. But to a very large extent, we really have to decide who's going to succeed. We need to know who's going to succeed. And the only way you're going to find that out is by learning from the ones who fail. Why do patients fail multifocal? Some are very successful and they're wonderful. The next patient you find that don't work. We really have to be more mindful of this and look for things with patients that help us select the patients that are more successful and obviously deselect those that are more less successful. Now, I do apologise, I don't mean this particular slide to be patronising, but I do think it's, in, I showed to both ophthalmologists and optometrists, but it's so, so important to get the refraction correct. The two comments, a lot of um, both optometrists and ophthalmologists tend to underpower the distance prescription. If they find a plus 150, the temptation, if they find a plus 150 in the distance, plus 2 near, the temptation is to prescribe a plus 1 and a plus 250 out. Now, on a very focal lens, that works well. You can get away with it. If reality is seen, you've seen advised that in the past. But that doesn't work well with multifocal contour lenses. You've got to get the maximum distance prescription up. And that's the key. By getting the maximum distance prescription up, you can reduce the ad. It's behind the high ads that create the problems. And there's a South African optometrist called Derek Humphreys, who, after the Second World War, did 
Just use the Humphreys technique to do binocular balancing. This is to me the key point of that all. You know, you view a 612 letter, the other eye is fogged by plus 075. And because of that, because you're fogging so, so, so little, you've got phobia suppression. You've still got a binocular lock. And that's so important. You've got a binocular lock of phobial suppression. And so the good eye, the eye that's not fogged, try plus 025. And then you actually keep putting on plus 025 on either eye to finally get the maximum prescription. So when um, uh, minus 025 is preferred. So you're getting maximum plus powers, and that's the key. Often find a patient with plus two, plus two. You do a Humphrey's technique, plus two, two, five, plus two, seven, five. And I can't emphasize enough, working in the industry, in the problems people have with multifocals, often comes back to the distance prescription. <coughs> and the other comment is, from Derek Humphreys, is that do you actually do you do on a C12 letter on a duochrome or on a stunning chart? The problem with the standard chart sometimes is that you get difference in image size. The patient will pick the larger image size. So you really want to do a Humphreys on a geochrome to make sure that it's truly balanced and you get that maximum positive power out of them. Once you do that, you're on the road to success. Too many prescriptions, too weak, and then they maximise on, the, on the reading prescription and the whole thing falls apart. So as I say, being getting a prescription correct is a key part to it. Another key part, which I don't think we mentioned this morning, which uh, Tosh has talked a lot at the meeting about here at the BCLA next week, and this will be discussed at length, and that's ocular dominance. I'm working in practice, working in my own practice with patients, I cannot emphasise to you enough the importance of ocular dominance. And what John's doing right now is what we call directional sighting dominance. Um, it's not that successful, it's not that reproducible. Many, many patients come into this world left-handed, but because it's a right-handed world, they encourage to always use the right hand. So when they do sighting dominance, they'll often point with the right hand. They'll say they're right-handed, but underneath they're left-handed. They're born left-handed, but it's a right-handed world. And so directional sighting dominance can often lead you astray. Ocular motor dominance, there's, there's three types of ocular dominance. The other one is ocular motor dominance. There's not a great deal you can do that if a patient has to got a strabismus or something, obviously the dominance is going to be what he's spoken for. But the most important thing is sensory dominance. Sensory dominance is more important than the directional sighting dominance. And I've seen a few moments why that is so important. It's quite a simple technique to use, and it's one of those things that always amazes me every time I use it in practice. The blur suppression technique. I'm going to use Alvar as a, my patient. And it's quite easy, we have a plus, plus 150 out, and quite easily just put it in front of his right eye and ask him if it's blurred or clear, and put it into the left eye, blurred or clear, and do it again. And it's quite staggering when you get a patient strongly dominant because when you put the plus 150 in front of the non dominant eye, what's the difference? Put it in front of the dominant right eye, that's blurring it. It's quite marked, quite marked, and it tells you they've got strong suppression. It's important to get that right because obviously the left eye, always, the majority of the time will be the left. You find the patient doesn't notice any difference. That's the non-dominant eye. And the dominant eye will obviously be in the right eye. So bridge vision suppress, blood suppression test, are way to do it. I see some work done by um, in Denmark down the road uh, by um, Bell Longberg had some students actually go through 103 patients and he goes and all in proclaim multifocal, by affinity multifocal. And they took their dominance. And we had in, <coughs> pardon me, in his sighting dominance as well as blur suppression. So two the two dom the dominant techniques. And when they mastered the same dominance, right eye and both, the continence patient was subject and successful. Those are mixed dominance, where they could either be sighting, be left and right, and they didn't match those patients, only 34% of succeeded. So mixed dominance can be quite a problem. So right from the very beginning, you tell the patient the chance of success or failure do depend to a large extent on this dominance issue. And uh, as I said, the number of times I've got patients who sight with the right eye, but we do blur suppression, it's left. So it's important we get that right. And the other thing is, let's not forget that ocular dominance can change. It can change the distance you look at. It can change from near to distant. But ocular dominance is something you need to get to grips with when you're fitting a multifocal lens. 
It's a very important aspect of things. The other thing is angle kappa. Um, when I was at Optometry School, we used to learn angle kappa and put it to sleep. What the hell do we need to know that for? Um, you know, this is just like learning Latin, it's just a complete waste of time. Well, let's come back to kick this in the backside because we do need it. Angle kappa is very important. Uh, this is a, a, an optic, what we're doing here. It's putting a soft multifocal lens on top of an eye and then doing measuring angle kappa. See what's happening. And it's an important technique because this particular patient was wearing an 8.7, proto multifocal 8.7, 40 before minus 3 plus 250 out. It's quite straightforward. But look here, the difference between the angle, the angle cap is quite large here. And so naturally, if you're going to decenter it by this amount, of, by this amount the vision is going to be really affected. So if you've got a small pupil, if you've got a lens that's decentering quite a lot, the vision results in this one will be quite poor. So forget the fit of the vision. Then when you actually change it, actually put into tighten it, tighten it up to an 8.4, restrict its movements, the angle cap got smaller. So centration is absolutely critical um, on a multifocal that the lens sits over the um, visual axis. It's not going to work otherwise. And I often wonder, there's a huge, in the world of optometry um, and contact lenses, there's a huge, huge push forward in myopic control. Myopic control is very, very big uh, in the optometry field. A lot of the contact lens companies investing, like Johnson Johnson, Coopers, um, Ziba, are investing large sums of money into myopic control. And again, with these myopic control lenses, where you have plus in, plus in the periphery, um, they've got to centre properly. I think actually critical we measure our angle kappa on these patients. So that's one use of angle kappa. Pupil size seems elementary. We all know the importance of the pupil size, but we do need to um, to measure it. Um, the bifocal multifocal comes in a 2.3 millimeter <coughs> distance version. So if you've got a six millimeter eye, it's common sense you're going to get good 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 vision in the distance. This is going to be out of in focus, that's going to be out of focus. Anyway, I'm going to say, as soon as you actually put a sort of small people in, they often find when it gets bright, they find the vision gets just decides to deteriorate. So again, you need to be aware of pupil size, um, as well as and kappa, you know, you know, pupil size, and both line dark conditions. And the last thing which I think is really is quite a, an issue is driving at night. This is probably the area where most multifocal patients trip up. They find driving up quite, quite troublesome. They often find that the headlights and the small pin sources become rather blurred. And also your binocularity is more challenged in night driving than in day driving. As a fact, a guy called Mike Collins down in Australia did some work quite recently, where he actually compared the periodic correction of a number of patients with a number of different techniques. At 255 patients, so it's no small study, and they use a um, no correction by focal spectacles, aggressive spectacles, monovision, multifocals, a lot. And um, tried all of these and actually, actually assessed the driving ability of these patients. And the uh, pharmacy is no surprise that multifocal learners were significantly less satisfied after their vision. So when you have a multifocal patient, it's important that you have proper expectations. If the patient is a driver for a living, driving night and dark, then you will have to think which type of lens you're going to use. Yeah, this is growing. Um, this is one from, I think, uh, a couple of years ago. As you see, what's happening is that the number of patients in blue are vision corrected is obviously increasing as presbyopia kicks in as we get older. And this is the content lens wearing population which is declining. Um, and what the content lens is trying to do is move this, this decline further along. You're never going to develop a lens for somebody in their 80s. It ain't going to work. What you're trying to do, this decline starts, but interestingly, um, you can actually see it starting to decline here. In the 30s, these are probably low myopes, so you don't wear content lens anymore. I mean, you can see it declining here. What you're trying to do is keep this uh, further into their 40s and to the 50s. And that really is the aim of the continental industry to get patients to stay multifocals for longer. We know that uh, the, yeah, not the babies are boom, but we you know the present time when at the peak of the percentage of patients in the lab is quite high. 
So it's an opportunity really to start filling in periodic corrections, um, such as uh, multifocal contact lenses and multifocal spectacles as well. So, what's the most important thing about filling multifocal lenses? Um, personally, I think the thing is, is having that bit of flexibility. Listen to the patient, this is what they want to do. And there's lots of choice out there, a huge amount of choices. And it really is important that the optometrist, the ophthalmologist, fully understand the capabilities of different lenses to be successful. Um, we have lenses now that have overnight, and lenses like the, the one here, the Biofinity Multifocal, is licensed by the FDA for seven days and six nights continuous wearing. So extended wear lenses, um, air optics, pure vision, by Bausch & Lomb. Also have high oxygen thermal lenses, basically wear them for long periods of time. What I think is a bit of a solution, which I think is an interesting, there's two now, there's one by Sorflon, on the European market, there's the Procol One Day Multifocal, a one day lens. So one day lens is a very interesting lens, it's set in here. And fit it correctly, it's very successful. It tends to be very good for distance for driving, distance vision, it gives enhanced near vision. So a lot of patients may want to do it both. A study done by J and J, Johnson Johnson, about three years ago, we actually got a group of patients who wore multifocal lenses. But the same group then wore multifocal spec lenses. About 22% are successful in both. The one that has to have those lenses. And 78% decide they wanted both. And that's the key. Sometimes we too too slow just thinking there is one path that either, either they require contact lenses or spectacles or surgery. Sometimes there's many paths that a patient may want to take. I have a number of patients who wear multifocal spectral lenses at work. If you have a nurse, for instance, you've got to read a, a, a vial. If she makes a mistake, as we all know in this room, it can be fatal. Um, so then they have to see it absolutely 100% perfect. They want to show their progressive spectral lenses. And progressive spectral lenses have come on hugely in the last 5 or 10 years. Hugely. And then in the evenings for leisure, for sports, they can wear one-day lenses. So we need that flexibility to give our patients a choice of what they can use. They then make the choice rather than tell them what they, can, what they should be having. Talk to patients and find out. And actually I think you may find a lot of patients are quite happy mixing and matching. And I think that's the way forward with, uh, with uh, fitting the, the pressure of the patient. Um, and I say I think one-day lenses now are getting a lot more popular. Very popular in Europe, they're becoming more popular in the North, in North America. I think you'll find it will be the way forward. A mix and match between the two. That's a quick run through, so I'll try to run through basically what's available to you to give you a flavour of, uh, of what we have in the multifocal contact lens field. It is a growing business, mono vision, as I say, has declined. Multifocal lenses are certainly part of the, of the future of contact lenses. And whether they actually completely satisfy every pressure is debatable because of the problems of astigmatism. That will always be a slight problem, um, but I said the RGP solved that. Sadly, RGPs are beginning part of the past, which I think is a great shame, because many patients have benefited from that, um, but uh, that's the way the market goes at the present time. So, I hope that gives you a true flavour of what's available to you, and uh, if you have any questions, please ask. But otherwise, thank you for listening. Thank you.